episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 22, Episode 4. My name is Chris. And my name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Welcome back for another week. Thanks for having me. I believe the B-Man is in Montana right now. Montana, you see. Well, you there. see, he and I were riding on the back of the sub. This is a long story. Okay. And he told me about how he had always wanted to visit Montana. Montana. So mm. now he is in Montana. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, we've got All a right. great show this week. Oh, we Really do. great show. Awesome. I got a theme. I want to turn you guys into an internet radio star. It turns out crazy easy to set up your own fully automated radio station under Linux for free. Yep. And I'll tell you how you can do it for podcasting, how you can do it for yep. general fun, or how you can just do it for recreational use around your house. Just like the big boys. Uh, we've also got some interesting news stories coming up, including OpenSUSE is lost and looking for direction. Uh oh. We'll well, that's not Maybe we've got okay. some advice for them. Hmm. All right. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see how that works out. Uh, before we get to that, though, why don't I give you my Linux pick this week? Are I you would ready, like sir? to hear about that. Yeah. All definitely. right, sir. The Big Brain server runs Linux. This is uh, one hmm. of SGI's new supercomputers, and uh, it has it can go up to four thousand nine hundred sixty-four cores or ninety-six cores. Sorry, wow. sixty-four terabytes of memory, and it can be equipped with uh, ATI, or, or I'm sorry, AMD or Intel CPUs. Interesting. Wow. Uh, standard config would be an Intel uh, Xeon CPU with power. eight cores. Nice. And nice. what it is, dude, is check this out. Nice, nice, it is nice. this massive rack. <laughs> and what you do is you assemble wow. these two per rack, and they take about four U's of rack space. And there's two in each U, in each four U space. That is crazy. And uh, what it, it, it what they they actually tout it as a general purpose computer in the sense that they're all they're all x86 based chips. Really. And it runs Linux. And what's what they say was really hmm. awesome about it is. For uh, for colleges and things that or or universities, whatever it is where they need to do these large data crunching experiments, okay, sure, they can set up the general parameters for that experiment on just a standard Linux desktop. That's and then they can just pick up that nice. project and move it onto this supercomputer. Oh wow! Generally, when you're talking about a supercomputer, okay. that you know you're talking four thousand cores, right? And things like yeah, that's what I say. The applications mm. are custom written. Sure, this actually uses a kernel level level piece of software in okay. the Linux kernel to. To take all of those cores and all of that memory and all of those systems right. and actually treat them as one entire PC. Wow. So one wow. there there is a there is a okay. master controller that, that addresses the memory in those other machines as its own local memory space. That is cool. And so to the operating system and to the applications, it all looks yeah. like one giant machine. Nice. Yeah. So, so I'm going to head down to Best Buy and go pick myself up one. Oh, wait. I probably can't do that now, can <laughs> They I? start at $30,000. They probably are not going to be <laughs> sold by the blue shirt folks, so probably not. No, no. Uh, okay. Geek Squad is not going to be equipping this one. Probably uh, not. Probably no support there. This got the uh, Xeon E5 family product on there. Runs off-the-shelf, unmodified Linux software. You wow. can also put the uh, NVIDIA Tesla accelerators in there if you have some GPU crunching Oof. you need to do. Stephen Hawking's already got his hands on one of these things. Oh, and, uh, he's got all yeah. the cool stuff. That's great. Yeah. That Once really you start exciting. specking this thing up and you actually fill out a whole cabinet, though, I think that number gets a lot higher than 30,000. As does the cooling. Because yeah. you think about it, you know, 30,000, I know it sounds nuts, but and actually when you're talking about this kind of iron. That's it's, not it's really not, not that, that bad. It's yeah. not that crazy. It's a little crazy, but it's not that crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. All right. Cool. Good show this week. Everything is a theme. All of the app picks and the main review this segment's all themed. But yep. before we get to that, we need to say good morning to the fine folks over at GoDaddy.com. Good here, look morning. At this. Good. I'll put, I'll put uh, with the magic of the internet, I can put, nope, nope. I was going to say I could put Danica right between us, but I can't. <laughs> Dang it. Well, she's just floating just above us do a, yeah. like a beautiful yeah. angel of dot Put your arm around her, right? You know. And Danica, the beautiful GoDaddy angel today, stops by to let us know that GoDaddy has a special deal for the Linux Action Show viewers. Cool. If you want to spice something up, you know, do like a clever naming yeah. thing, like monder.us or oh, you know, that's exciting. Stuff like so you that. can actually bundle the two the two items together. I mean, sure. Oh yeah. Why not? Yeah. And if you're going, so okay. So the problem with the dot us domain, you're right, right. Is that they're expensive. Nineteen nine nineteen ninety nine generally. Sure, sure. GoDaddy has a deal where you can get the dot us domain for three dollars and ninety nine cents. Three bucks. Three dollars and ninety nine cents, wow. Matt. If you That's use cool. the code three ninety nine US five, you can get a dot right. US. So give your project a clever, a clever naming scheme. Set up your pro America blog. Maybe you're doing some barbecue in this this summer, and you mm -hmm. want to have a barbecue blog. You better end that 
if you do a barbecue blog and you don't end it in .us, I don't even care what country you're in. What's oh, the yeah. matter with you? You can barbecue us, barbecue me. Bar- Dude. I mean, that sounds a little morbid, but it's really cool. I mean, you can do some pretty cool stuff with that. I don't care what it's called. It's you just know. if it's about barbecue, it needs to end yeah. in .us. That's just a policy that needs to be made. And now you can pick it up for $3.99 if you use the very special code 399US5 or That's use the link in the buy. show notes. Thank you, GoDaddy. That is a great buy. We've also awesome. got some other deals in the show notes that uh, expire at the end of the month. Okay. But go grab your .us. $3.99. That's, nah. They don't it's do these kinds of deals very often. No. no. no All right, sir. Okay. Are you ready for an app pick? I'm ready for an app pick. Let's I, do it. I, uh, I need to, do I have a hat here? I don't. I need I need to put myself. You do not have a hat adjacent to I need like a area. cone of shame or something. Mm. I, I Actually, your hats are over there. Yeah. Uh, okay. My app pick this week okay. is one of the apps mm. that I have used... I think for a couple of years. Really? Nearly on a daily basis. And I have failed to make it a nap pick. For some Seriously? unknown reason. It wasn't until somebody stopped by the chat room and asked me. Really? I have actually mentioned the app before on the show, sure. but I didn't actually make it a pick. Interesting. Uh, it is it is high time, Matt, that I I think it's time. Yeah. I have to give a shout out to Stream Furious. Yes, I have mentioned it, but I've never made an app pick. Stream Furious is a great shoutcast, ice cast internet radio streaming application for Android. Oh, cool. And what's great okay. about it is it has some custom buffering. If I think you might have to get the Pro. I bought the Pro a long time ago. Oh, they yeah. have a free and a Pro version. Mm-hmm. You can do some custom buffering uh, thi- uh, uh, you know, settings. Sure. It, has, it has a directory you can search for internet radio streams. Nice. You can go over to... You, nice. It's great. It's so, like you can go over... So we have... Uh, for example, Matt, if you for go example, over to right. jblive.am, right? Okay. And over on the jblive.am, we have very simple links that you can just... Uh, copy on your Android device, like this MP3 sure. link right here. You hold, tap, tap, hold, copy. Right. Paste that into Stream Furious, and then every time you open up Stream Furious, you've got the bookmark in there, you just tap it and it starts streaming it right away. Does oh, a nice that's a buffer. time saver. I like that. It works yeah. over 3G. Uh, so Stream Furious is, uh, I love this app. Nice. And nice. Uh, I just, I can't believe it. I can't well, and if they have a pro versus free, clearly supporting the pro. If you're using this, is supporting yeah. the developer. Pro so, is the pro yeah. is uh, five ninety nine. Well, shoot, and yeah, that's uh, it adds things like podcast support, sleep timer, which was yeah. the original reason I got it. Actually, now that I recall, I did Soma FM on sleep timer on this bad boy, right. and that's the way you do it. Also, uh, the uh, pro version supports um, AAC plus and authenticated radio streams. So, Stream Furious, cool. there's the free version linked in the show notes. But if you are down with that, grab the pro version. Yeah. I really like it. All right, Matt. All right. Now, I've got a desktop oh, app yeah, pick yeah. this week that is so awesome. So awesome. Cool. It's it's also a shame that we've never mentioned it. It is called Mix, M I Triple X. And Mix hmm. is a piece of software that lets you mix two different clips together and it supports libraries and bins and, Oh, really? Okay. And all kinds of Well, that could be useful. Oh, it dude, it's super Very useful. And if you're on the Mac, it does iTunes yeah. integration, sure, uh, sure. things like that. But what I can use this for, and what I think people might want to use this for, is it supports some really elegant crossfading and queuing and things like that. Oh, so that by itself is a big guess. Oh, it's very nice. If you're yeah, so, like, for definitely. example, if I'm going to play two clips on Unfilter, right? right? I can right. queue them both up. I can play it, and then I can mark in the clip as it's going. I can hit one, and I can hit two, and then I can That's hit three. That's fantastic. And when I mark those things one, two, three, next time I hit returns, it goes right back to those triggers. Oh. So I'm just boom, 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 and I can queue yeah. them up. And then when that clip's done, I can fade to the next. And what's awesome about this is Mix supports connecting to an IceCast server. Nice. So you can broadcast directly from Mix to an IceCast server and then retransmit to hundreds That's of people if you wanted to. That's serious control. I yeah, like that. Very granular. It supports like uh, MP3. It supports mm-hmm. AUG, Wave, FLAC, AIFF, sure. all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't. I just have a lot of good things to say. And about you can it. skin it. That's cool. You can skin it. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, especially if you're looking for a certain type of contrast, or you're, you know, it, it, it depends on everybody. But I think being able to skin stuff. Oh, yeah. is helpful. It's nice and, to give you that yeah, kind of control. Definitely. Um, anyways, check it out. Wow. You can also do recording. You can bring cool. in your own mics. You can mix between really? music and your microphone. You can do voiceovers. You can auto duck. Oh, uh, you can um, you, it establishes a clip library for you. It is very cool. And if you are doing mm. any kind of uh, shoutcast streaming or right. icecast streaming, and you want to say you want to have music before you go on, yeah, you can right. have this, and then you could fade into your local broadcast, and then fade back out to the music. Oh, uh, that's nice. Playing live clips work, live, great. all that kind of stuff runs under uh, uh, Windows, Mac. And Linux, there wow. is uh, Ubuntu packages available, but you can also grab uh, packages for mini distros. So That's check cool. it out, mixxx.org, if you want to download it. All right, now awesome. this this breaks the theme 
for the oh, week for the picks. Okay. But the distro we'll pick, I could have done something like Ubuntu Studio. Or, sure. That just seems it's so obvious. Predictable. Yeah. I want to talk about something that Alan on TechSnap actually mentioned, okay. and it is a ton of fun. We talk about security a lot on this show. Right. And, you know, making sure that you got things locked down, you got a firewall if you're yeah, out, yeah. if you're roaming out on the internet, things mm-hmm. like that. What if you just want to have a good time and try out some exploits that you've heard about? Or maybe you want to try something like Metasploit or a tool like Nessus, or you want to play with Nmap. Then sure. you need to download Metasploitable. It's a virtual Metasploitable. machine. Metasploitable. That's a Metasploitable. Tough word to say. It's a, it's a play on Metasploit, which is a okay. which is a framework for using and taking advantage of vulnerabilities. Interesting. Okay. A lot of times it's meant for penetration testing. That's what I've used it for professionally sure. is for penetration testing. Sure. This is sort of like a playing ground. It's a honeypot okay. that you can throw out there or uh, anything like that that you want to just bang against. Uh, if, you wanna, if you've heard about a vulnerability in SSH and you want to see if you could actually use that vulnerability to take over machine, yeah. it's a lot easier than you might think. Uh, you don't need programming experience or something like that to right. do this. Oh, you do not. Okay, well, that's interesting. No, no, no. Okay. And this Metasploitable is a VMware image that is very vulnerable by design. It's got zero day flaws. It's got bad password. So this policies. is almost something you could use to uh, b- become more comfortable security yeah. type topics. That's it, interesting. It yeah. is. Uh, it is a great way to to learn. See the problem mm-hmm. with like things like Nessus, which is a security scanning vulnerability tool, mm-hmm. or Metasploit, which takes advantage of existing vulnerabilities. Right. Is if you don't have any vulnerabilities, you can't really learn how to use the tool. You need a testing bed, a testing and, ground. Right. And there's no you. better way to yeah. secure your system than to use the same tools that the attackers would be using. That makes so sense. So you grab this VM image, which you can throw in virtual box or whatever you want, yeah. and you just throw tools against it and learn. Uh, so it's called Metasploitable, and it's from offensive-security.com. That's fantastic! I Link love, I love in that. The show notes. Oh man, I, oh, I, that's great. I can't, I can't imagine that uh, I'm not going to be playing with this. I mean, I got to yeah. get this. So yeah, hone your skills. There you go, Matt. All right, all right. Well, that's all our picks for the top of the show. Let's do the news. So, uh, what's new in the news? All right, Matt. Our top story this week is another Linus Torvald story. A Isn't series it of stories. Mm. He's uh, He's been in the headlines a couple of times yeah. this week, so I figure we'll just do a Linus roundup right here at the top of the oh, news okay. roundup. Sounds good. Uh, so Linus has uh, been interviewed by the BBC because he was mm. a, he was a member of that. Uh, there was an award process. Right. I seem to remember him yep. winning something. Yeah. Uh, he won the Millennium Technology Prize. Or he's one of the people. Mm-hmm. So I think he's mm-hmm. getting somewhere like a, he might get as much as $750,000 for that. That would hurt my feelings. He went on to say that uh, Linux succeeds thanks mostly to selfishness and trust. Uh, only hmm. in Linus's world could these two things actually go really well together. Yeah, he said, that's uh, uh, hmm. That's a twist. This is what he means by selfishness. The early selfish reasons to do Linux tended to be centered around the pleasure of tinkering. That's why I did it. Programming was my hobby, passion, really. And learning how to control the hardware was my own selfish goal. And it turned out I was not alone in that. Interesting. It's kind of interesting, right? That's an interesting perspective for sure. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I, I, can, I think it's a lot that. of people, same reason why a lot of people get into podcasting. Yeah, I absolutely think so. There's nothing wrong with that. He said here now, uh, he talked a little bit about how, and this isn't something that I've given a significant amount of thought to, but in a lot of ways, we're very lucky that Linus Torvalds is sort of at the head of the Linux kernel. This is true. Because uh, he talks about uh, bias, and I never thought about how awful would it be if if Linus had this really strong uh, bias towards one distribution. That's true. That could be detrimental for the overall uh, ecosystem. So he goes on to say... uh, I simply do not want people to even have the appearance of bias. I want people to be able to trust that I am impartial, not only because they've seen me maintain the Linux kernel over the years, but because they know that I simply Hmm. don't have any other incentives where I might want to support one Linux company over the other. He goes on to talk about how now he works full-time on Linux, Mm -hmm. and he was very careful in how he set that up because he didn't want to be sponsored by a particular company like Red Hat. Right, right. In order to ally all fears, we actually made sure that my contract explicitly says that my employer does not have any control over what I do. The Linux Hmm. Foundation cannot tell me what to do. That's interesting, and it's important freedom, uh, no pun intended, but it's certainly uh, giving him the freedom to do what he needs to do so that he can he gets partial. paid uh, yeah. a decent salary oh, full yeah. time, He's and part of that part of that hiring contract was we yeah. can't tell you what to do. Right. <laughs> exactly. Oh man, that's, that's a sweet lighted, deal. Right? That's a sweet uh, deal. It's basically one paragraph talking about what I'm supposed to do, and it basically boils down to the fact that everything I do has to be mm. open source, and the rest of the contract is all about the ways the company I work for cannot influence me. Works for me. Makes then sense. He, then he goes on. This is another thing I've noticed Linus does is he can take very heady complex 
concepts, sure. like the concept of trust. Right. And okay. he can just boil it down to like the core essential ingredients. And this is why I think he is really good at what he does. Uh, he's very effective. There's no says, question of that. Trust is not about some kind of absolute neutrality or anything like that. Right. It's about a certain level of predictability and knowing that you won't be shafted. Makes sense. And you know what? I also think that works as a podcaster. You know, it's like with your with your co-host. You don't yes. if you don't ever know if he's going to be there that week, there is a certain level of trust that's hard to establish. That's true. But Matt's here, so everything's fine. I'm not bitter about it. I promise. I just thought overall those were really insightful uh Well, it's an interesting way to kind of look into his mind and see how he ticks and what he thinks and how all that comes together. And so, you know, yeah. Linus has always had this really level headed sort of like what are those guys doing approach to Microsoft. So yes, he I has. thought it was interesting now in two thousand twelve to kind of tune in and see what Linus's take on Microsoft was. Uh, he said, I'm relieved that Microsoft seems to have at least some degree uh, stopped treating the Linux community as the enemy. The whole That's cancer nice. and un-American thing was pretty embarrassing. That, yeah, that, that comes <laughs> down to uh, an interesting choice in leadership on the uh, Microsoft front, so we'll leave that there. I, I think it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's great though the way he just sums it up is like, boy, yeah, wasn't it embarrassing for themselves when they were calling Linux a cancer? Well, because it, it, he was Teflon man, it didn't matter to him. I mean, I just, that's really the whole thing. Is it's why, it why is, would he though, care? Looking yeah. back in retrospective, it didn't it didn't paint Linux in a bad light. It no. didn't paint open source. It just was an embarrassment for well, Microsoft. You, and they, frankly, you just have to look at who's using it. It's it sells itself. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. like, obviously it's what what was being said didn't make any sense. Uh, so. He also goes to talk a little bit about the Raspberry Pi, mm. and mm -hmm. uh, he says that uh, I find things like the Raspberry Pi to be an important important thing trying to make it as uh, make it possible for a wider group of people to tinker with computers and just yeah. playing around and here is a great point that i think we've made on this show before too okay. making computers cheap enough that you really can not only afford the hardware at big scale right. but perhaps more important is also you can afford failure that is an interesting point yeah yeah so you're not cr there's no spilled tears it's cheap Makes enough sense. that you can afford not to have a i don't care if everything doesn't work out Makes sense to me. You can put it in the closet and be done with it. You didn't invest a tremendous amount of money. In right, it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Works. Now, uh, Ooh, here we go. Linus also <laughs> made headlines this week. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, Everybody stop. We need to take a little drink before we play this one. Now, mm. if you are easily okay. offended, you might want to divert your eyes if you're watching the video version. Uh, we won't be playing the audio just because we want to keep the show family friendly. Right. Yeah. Though the live stream did convince us. But it. I don't think you're going to need the audio to get the general... No point. Um, I think it'll come through. Linus was at a, a talk uh, hosted by the Alto Center for Entrepreneurship in, um, it's called ACE on June 14th, mm -hmm. and he was being interviewed by Will Cardwell, I believe, and if this was a, this was after the mm. interview, there was a Q&A session. This came up okay. from the Q&A session, and they said, you know, oh, stand by. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. They came by, they asked, you know, what are your thoughts on mm -hmm. NVIDIA? And now, since we won't be playing the audio, okay. Linus went on to say that NVIDIA has been extremely frustrating to work with because mm. they rely heavily on Linux, but they have been one of the most difficult companies to deal with. And he says, F you to NVIDIA. And yeah, he just comes right out and uh, says, hey, NVIDIA, F you. And then he gets a round of applause. From well, yeah, no, they were all about it. And, you know, <laughs> I, I, I've got some thoughts there. Uh, so what do you think? Now, you are an NVIDIA guy. You like NVIDIA cards. I like NVIDIA cards. I like the fact that they're, and I own both. I own uh, both uh, AMD, ATI, you know, and uh, NVIDIA as well. And having worked with both consistently through the years, NVIDIA has worked better and, and uh, you know, not just with the open source stuff, but also with the proprietary stuff. And you know, yeah. the NVIDIA driver yeah, from I a mean, user perspective no, has been, in, in my opinion, for yeah. years now, better than the it, ATI It's been more experience. consistent. ATI is all over the map. Uh, it, it's so the, bad. The later like, cards with the yeah. later distros, like, uh, yeah. you know, 1204 Ubuntu loads the driver just fine. Yeah. Things like that. But yeah, I now he is, though, talking more like from a kernel source collaboration standpoint. Yeah, I mean, and I, and I understand what you're saying, but because there's still some dependency, because there is a finite amount of, uh, you know, uh, graphic graphic cards and things out there, graphic card companies, y you may not want to uh, piss them off too much. I'm just throwing that out there, especially when you're, uh, NVIDIA is doing this I, you know, I, I just I think he might be salting the salting the water a little bit. I don't know. I'm, so you're I, coming mm, at it from uh, okay. you're coming at it from Linux needs Nvidia standpoint. I, they do. I'm I, sorry. I mean, uh -huh. at, least, at least you know. See, I think Linus feels that Nvidia needs Linux because true. because of Android yeah, and Tegra. That's true. Yeah, and mobile, like that. And mobile's changing it, and yeah. uh, and yeah. also because there's That's a true. there's a whole pro line 
of uh, workstations that run Linux and yeah. NVIDIA Quadro yeah. cards and things like that. And see, that's that's the sticky wicket that people don't think about is where NVIDIA really makes some money is that's on those true. Quadro cards. You know, those that's are like $1,500 point. for like an entry-level Quadro sure. card. Sure. And those are very, in large deployments, those go into Linux stations. That's true. No, that, and that's a great point. I, I guess my bigger issue is that by him making that statement, which, you know, hey, I think that's great. You know, he's saying what he feels, but... And he's, what I are you think, accomplishing? It might. I you think. Know, I, mean, I think what might have come up too is like uh, you know the failure to support of Optimus. And, yeah. And oh, like now that. that I'll give you. Okay, that'll give you. You're right. See, Linus just doesn't but, have to worry, right? Yeah, he doesn't. He's care. king of the world. Yeah, he's, he, he's Linus Torvalds. His yeah. his boss can't even tell him what. And to do. as he you po- have a as boss. you pointed out, because of the dependency, uh, you know, he can't say stuff like that and get I, away with it. It's been huge know? on Reddit. So. It's been oh, huge yeah. on Hacker News. It's been all over the Linux news sites. Uh, I've got the wallpaper. Yeah, yeah. There's some wallpapers yeah. over on the yeah. There's some, on, yeah, yeah. some very like Barack Obama hope style wallpapers. Exactly. Oh yeah, I'll have um, to uh, provide that and show. I I guess uh, I guess what I feel like is Linus was sort of is just feeling what all of us as a community are feeling. Like oh yeah. Hey, you know how you guys depend on us? Well, f you for not because what it is is we're sick of people riding on the backs True. of Linux and then not turning around and giving them full support. That's fair. It's no, sort of like fair. it's sort of like the the peak of hypocrisy when uh, Google Drive. Oh, and Google Docs yeah. Google is anyone. powered by Linux. Mm-hmm. The files you upload are stored on a Linux server. Yep. The web pages are served using Linux. All the APIs go mm-hmm. back to Linux servers, yep. and then they yep. roll out Google Drive for desktops, and they don't give a Linux client. And they say, oh, yep. but we're going to get to it in about six months to nine months. You oh, know, yeah. We, it's like... Yeah. It's I, frustrating. I it's frustrating, especially when they're that dependent on Linux. It just fostering yeah. that kind of stuff would, so. fo- would would encourage desktop Linux, which mm. would make Linux better, which would then trickle back to them because that's the nature of freaking open source. Right, right. And while I know it's hard for some penny pincher to say, well, mm. if we release an NVIDIA driver for Linux that does support this, or if we make Google Drive available mm. for Linux first, uh, then we won't. You know, our profitability will be two percent less. They don't, but they can't look at the big picture and say, right. but the open source sort of butterfly effect is that it'll make our very own infrastructure better. Oh, absolutely. Wow. And it will come back in full circle in their favor if they let it. And so uh, there so, you yeah. go. Linus yeah. Linus passes on a uh, thanks, <laughs> NVIDIA, for all the love. Thanks, Linus. Uh, how about you step <laughs> it up a little bit? All right, moving on. All righty. It's time to talk about something that is a little concerning. Mm. Uh, Phronix has an article, and also OpenSUSE has their very own blog post okay. about OpenSUSE is having some problems and is seeking some new direction. Well, yeah. OpenSUSE's uh, mm. new release that uh, they've been working on, 12.2, is slipping. The mm-hmm. betas have mm-hmm. slipped, features have slipped, mm-hmm. the release candidate has slipped. Uh, and so some, some vocal members of the community have come out and said that uh, we need to make some big changes. Uh, among some of the ideas expressed, we're abandoning release mm. schedules for OpenSUSE altogether. Oh. Maybe go- or older. maybe going back to an annual release. True. Or moving to okay. a pure rolling release model built around OpenSUSE's tumbleweed. I'm going to probably put my vote in for a rolling release just because that gives them, if they're having a great month, they can roll that out. If they're having a lousy three months, they can roll it out that way. I mean, it gives them a little more flexibility. So I agree. I, I think rolling release, bet. rolling release with an annual, like, boom. Yeah. Here we go. See, the problem yeah. OpenSUSE has is mm. they've got a fundamental issue where their support window is something like 18 months. Oh, okay. And sure. that is just not long enough to run on a server. No, it's not. So no. they're, But they're kind of drawing that line, saying, well, we don't want to support anything longer than that, and we have our SUSE Enterprise product if you want to go that route. Okay. Problem is, is, so what Red Hat doesn't admit is CentOS makes them a ton of money because oh, yeah. what you can yeah, do is you can deploy CentOS and then when you're ready, you step up to Red Hat or exactly. you can deploy a bunch of Red Hat servers and when you need a, a stand-in, you can do CentOS yep. and CentOS is supported for years. Yes. Their release that came out in 2008 is still supported. Yep. Okay, so uh, SUSE is sort of up against that with Ubuntu doing 12, uh, tw- mm-hmm. with long-term support with like 12.04. Yep. Debian has their long-term supports. OpenSUSE is sort of in this weird range along with Fedora, but nobody uses Fedora on real production hardware. No. Uh, so... I guess well they open need to differentiate themselves somehow. I mean, they're, yes, I mean that's really exactly. And the they why have, do I care factor? They have the gallery know? and they have the build service. Sure, they need to fundamentally retool and rethink about what makes them competitive. Yeah, and then focus on that. See, I think what the problem is, and I have noticed this forever. Mm. And we have people from the SUSE project who watch the show, mm-hmm. and yeah. I mean, total respect for all of those people, but. SUSE is super good at rearranging the deck chairs. They are. About once are. a year, every yeah. two years, they just rearrange the deck chairs. Hey, everybody, look what we're doing. Yeah. Doing this big overhaul. And everybody who's watching it goes, well, that just sounds like a bunch of people. It's, it, oh, it's weird. When you read when you chaotic. read the official OpenSUSE blog, it yeah. sounds like 
bureaucracy in a way. It, well, yeah, it is. And that's, I mean, just, yeah, I, I think that's really what they're running into is they're creating problems where there are none and they really are losing their way as to what the value is to uh, people that are using them. And I, there I, seems to be you know, maybe not, there. maybe not enough not enough uh, chiefs because no. even this even this blog post that's Complete written here is, by uh, Joss uh, Porvit or Povlet is mm-hmm. um it has a very odd voice. It's like, well, we think this, but this uh, this vocal member of the community thinks this, but we think maybe this, but this vocal community member said this, so we think maybe something like this. And it's just are this they too weird... democratic in this process? Is that the problem? There's there's a lack of a figurehead that they can point maybe. to. Maybe it you also know. feels very defensive. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, oh, people Apologetic, are claiming maybe? people are claiming we're mm-hmm. getting this wrong, and well, here's why we think maybe we need to do it, and we think maybe if we make these small changes, it's. I hate to make this correlation. But it's like when mm. you hear about Microsoft and how Steve Ballmer was 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 sort of weeding out a lot of the middle executive layer and bringing right. new people in, bringing engineers in, right. and it's like, again, that just sounds like you're shuffling people around yeah. and you're not actually fixing the core problems. Yeah, exactly. Like what? If, how's that address the key the key if, uh, issues? Like one of the benefits. things they're having problems yeah. with is honestly the build service goes down sometimes and okay. they can't work because they pipe everything through the build service. So they miss deadlines simply because the build mm, service is okay. down. Okay. How is reassigning people? going to fix that problem right how does reassigning people fix the issue where bad packages are making it in and things are unstable and you're missing deadlines makes sense maybe mm-hmm. somebody will have a little better uh, over of uh, you know overview of what's going on well and if that is happening if this is addressing the issue maybe they should share that um because i'm not seeing evidence of it but if it is that's great make sure yeah. we know it um, but obviously that's not happening i'm really worried about open i yeah i i, I think they're definitely going to be in real trouble and i think that with the uh, extra competition out there right now i think they, they're gonna have to really retool and rethink and yeah condense and, and, and they you know. have some components you know yeah. Yast is still pretty strong. Yeah, I know it's like one it of those is. things that pro users kind of uh, put their nose up at, but for like to, for enterprise deployments and things like that, yeah. especially people that are previous Windows admins moving over to Linux, Yast is extremely strong. Yeah, their their virtualization support is extremely strong. Their integration with the build service, you know, we talked yeah, about last week. That, they got strength. They're there, deploying. They're deploying to the the Microsoft Azure cloud mm-hmm. straight from mm-hmm. the gallery or build service. Yeah, they got some good stuff, but they really do kind of need to. Rethink the focus uh, they, they a little do. bit. Yeah. You know, you just see it in just how many different incarnations their name has had in the last five years. Oh, yeah. It, it is really, they, they don't have like a Mark Shuttleworth driving as far exactly. as I can tell. Exactly. I yeah, guess. it's a total lack of leadership. It really is. And if they can address that, I think they can go forward. And Metal Freak points out that, uh, you know, a rolling release is not really appropriate for a server. It's not, but if they were able to do a rolling release in such a way to where they still, as you pointed out, had uh, annual cutoffs at that, it, it would allow yeah. minor issues to be addressed during that process. Um, you know, if there needs to be a little bit of minor tweaking, but people can still choose to do an annual setup or whatever. I think it may be. this is my last. Uh, this will be my closing thought. Is okay. I think to be competitive with Red Hat Enterprise, mm-hmm. they have to go something incredibly radical, like bring Sled and Sles, the SLUS, mm-hmm. the SUS right. Linux Enterprise sure. server, and the desktop into some sort of more alignment so that way as a user i could somehow opt to use less repos that's true because it does feel like there's a real disconnect and, and i want to be able to deploy yeah. open susa for free right but continue to have security updates and mm-hmm. i know that means mm-hmm. like i want my cake and i want to eat it too but i am a firm believer that that does not drive away sales from no. the enterprise product because the enterprise product is being sold on support contracts yep. On, on long-term viability exactly. and things and, and and things like that and if and those I just I, I just I never ever ever deploy open Sousa in a client production yeah. scenario the incentive just isn't there exactly I will do CentOS I'll do Debian stable I'll do Ubuntu 1204 right. I'm not doing Sousa exactly and it's these fundamental problems they have to address and hopefully they will Hopefully they will. All right. Why don't we move on? Because Gnome right. surprised me. It's not going to be necessarily mm. in the next release, but we could see it soon. A Gnome App Center. A no, no, no. A Gnome App Center. This is not the Ubuntu App no. Center. This is Gnome doing it themselves. This which is, is the Gnome project. Mm. So they're currently uh, doing some work on the Gnome shell, and that's what you're going to really yeah. see in the next release of Gnome. But after that, you might actually see this new app store they're working on, if you can believe it. Uh, mm. We're talking things like LibreOffice might be in there, Firefox, Inkscape. Okay. Uh, this is really something. So for those of you who aren't on Ubuntu, I think a lot of people are pretty excited about this. Now, of course, this is going to be, these are going to be GTK-focused apps. If you're sure. watching the uh, video version, we have a comparison see the here. comparison, the, and I think I, everybody kind of can come to their own conclusion on what you're uh, more into. Ubuntu Software Center versus yeah. the GNOME Software yeah. Center. This is interesting. Uh, if mm. they, I hope, I don't, this might seem kind of funny, but I'm in okay. agreement with the chat room. The chat room saying it right now. I hope 
they put some paid apps in there, and that revenue can go towards the GNOME project. That would be the smart thing to do. Right? Absolutely. Though, mm. they are now competing with the Ubuntu Software Center exactly. or anybody else. Uh, OpenSUSE has talked about doing something like this. Well, and what I don't understand, if you're going to do this, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, wouldn't it be nice if they took what Ubuntu did and, I don't know, do it better rather than less? Um, you know, I just the, the layout is, it's very vanilla. It feels more like what you get with the uh, Software Center from Linux Mint. It honestly looks almost identical to it. Yeah, um, yeah. It's very, very, very boring. Very vanilla. There's no real compelling reason for well, me to care. Well, that's kind of gnome style, simple, you know. And, you know. It, yeah, it is, but it's not. It again, or you know, as you said, put some paid apps in there. Give me a compelling reason to care. So, yeah, I, you know, honestly, yeah. 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 Uh, so not all the chat room agrees that they should put some pay apps in there, but it's early. Yeah, or it's early day, or just make a compelling layout, whatever it is. You know, but, it, it could be. Yeah. It could be. Uh, you know, another rift though between Canonical and GNOME. Oh yeah, and that's going to continue to grow. They're very, they're very much going to completely different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, it's, but it's going to continue. Canonical's looking at this going. Well, I'm glad we're going Unity because we yeah. wouldn't want a competitor to be bundled right into our desktop. No, that and would then, be that'd be a pain. They'd have yeah. to deal with that. Yeah. No but this is, this is interesting. So I wonder mm. if now we will see other distros sort of compete against Canonical by adopting this as their default store. If they're smart, they'll watch and see how this does first. And yeah. if uh, that's what I would do. But it could I, end I would, up being like it. this against Canonical. It, it could be interesting. And of it course, could be interesting. What's the KDE camp going to do? Yeah. They're yeah, still going to use, you know, yeah. whatever. Because yeah. these, these are GTK apps. Yeah. That's going to be a whole other animal. Yeah, and of course, the uh, KDE uh, is probably just going to sit back and laugh at you know the back and forth. But They're I, working. Yeah. You know, they'll probably do something because they're working on, uh, for the Vivaldi tablet, they're working on a store. And I think it'll probably be a lot more visual um, than... Uh, yeah, the then, Vivaldi one is not. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's not, not really. No, no I've not no. seen it. Oh, I, very, I would have had that expectation. It's very menu driven. Uh, oh. I think in yeah, in the, we did a Linux action show, uh, Linux Fest Northwest 2012 wrap up episode, right. and then there's a quick clip of it of the interface. It's a little rough. Mm. Early days, also though. It's early days. Yeah. So, like I said, we'll hope that it's not just you know pushing menus at you. Hopefully, it'll be uh, a little but cleaner. would be interesting too though. Sorry to cut you off, but no, wouldn't sure. it be interesting to see how distros like Arch. Because it's, it's really going right. to depend on what kind of back-end software True. distribution. Are they using RPMs? Right. Are they using apt? Right, are they using right. something proprietary? Are they just giving yeah. everybody tar -GZs and putting them in their own folders, sort of like yeah. PBIs? Right. We'll have to see what happens. All right. Well, okay. we're, while we're talking about GNOME, let's talk about GNOME gaining hmm. SkyDrive support. Oh, another Microsoft first. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So they beat versus, Google Docs. Yeah, they they beat G Drive with GNOME 2.4. It makes two. You could set up your MS Live account in there and get access to, or I mean, I'm sorry, GNOME 3.6, mm -hmm. and get access to SkyDrive. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's that's the online collaboration where you store a doc in there and yeah. you can open it up and freaking, it was word live. So as you pointed out, this is once again an issue to where Microsoft is first, and we'll get into the other one later on. But right now, this uh, they've beaten Google. Uh, yeah. On this particular issue. And this is a company, Google, who runs Linux and Microsoft, who is newly tolerating Linux. Yeah. What, what's what's up with this here? Now, know? I don't know how much of this was from uh, hmm. from Microsoft. Uh, the uh, Well, the fact that it's even possible or someone did it or, you know, I mean, that yeah. just that it happened. Even that's if true. it's an ex ex that's external true. source. Yeah. Whoever, however, it's here. Yeah. And that's winning That's winning them points. So GNOME 3.6, so, boy, know. they're doing a lot of things. They're doing shell redesigns. Yeah. They're working on They're working on a new store. And, well, SkyDrive, I, I, which I will never use, but no, it's, I, it's there. No desire to. All right. Okay. Let's talk about another Microsoft product. While okay. we're, see how I did this? I kind of ramped nice the Microsoft. Segue. And then I'm going to nice. ramp us out. I'm going to ramp us out of it right here. All right. Skype. Oh, yes. Version 4.0 mm -hmm. is out. Now, you got a chance to play with this after three years. After three years. Right? And I've it's been, been, I've been uh, looking at Skype alternatives. I've written countless articles on it. Actually. You did a how-to on Jitsi. I did a how-to on Jitsi. I have another article coming out on Monday uh, over at datamation.com. But the, the main issue here is that Skype 4.0 was – it's pretty. Uh, I didn't notice any necessary stability enhancements, although I didn't have stability enhancements with the previous release. But I was really hoping to see group video chat. Oh, Not yeah. there. Everything yeah, else is basically it's it's lipstick on a pig. It's it looks pretty. It's stable. I'm I'm thrilled that they're still supporting it. Not because I like Skype, but because we have to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. But I I do want to see it continue, and I want some of those uh, features we're seeing in Windows. Frankly, that's the, where I'm uh, at. Uh, the new the new features include a new conversation and call view, which I showed in the gallery yeah. just a second ago. Improved lipstick. audio and video quality. That uh, they claim. I I didn't see it. I, it looked good, but I, I didn't see anything. Uh, Additional webcam support. I bet all that is is just taking better advantage of Linux's improved. Yeah, webcam but I support. mean, even then, before I had multiple webcams. I see yeah. none of the. They're making yeah. these claims, but I I saw no evidence of anything oh, new. Oh, new emoticons. 
Oh, well, then that changes everything. And tab need, conversation. Well, pfft, you know, I don't need group video chat. I got emoticons. I feel like pulling a Linus yeah. on Microsoft right now. Hey, Microsoft, <laughs> F you. <laughs> this feels like, this feels like a, okay, what's so frustrating about this? Here's what it is. Here's what it is. It was right. a couple of weeks ago, we had a story, is Microsoft killing Skype sure. for Linux? And Microsoft came out with a correction that said, we've got some great things in store. Stay tuned for Linux. Oh, yeah. And that was like three weeks ago? It was. If this is the turd we got? Although... As turds go, um, and with a little polish, the the big thing that I'm kind of holding on to is the fact that they are still supporting it. Skype, true, <laughs> you know, pre Microsoft wasn't supporting Squat. <laughs> All right, so you know, I'll, I'll take what I get. I'll take yeah, what that's I get. at least they're at least they're not yeah. killing it, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, good point. All right, that's fine. Uh, before we jet out of the news segment right. uh, and get into the big topic, I want to give uh, a little love for this Kickstarter project. Oh, we thought yeah. we cover these from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Now, everybody's familiar with Google TV. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually, am. everybody's heard of it, but not many people bought it. No, I don't think most people care. And uh, if you if you follow Google TV, yeah. you know that right now they're on the 2.2 .2 OS. They are, yes. And uh, some boxes are going to be upgraded to Honeycomb 3.0. Okay, well, that, that could make things interesting. No, man, remember Honeycomb? Yeah. Honeycomb was like that weird transition OS. It, it, that, well, it's not the OS itself, but the fact that there's some progression happening. That's the main thing is that they can then transition to something that doesn't suck. But yeah. Obviously, but yeah. This Kickstarter project is called the Pocket TV. TV and it turns any uh. any TV with an HDMI port into a smart TV. Oh. It's a little USB thumbstick here. I'll That's get the video going here. Now this has yeah. already met its goal. He had a goal of a hundred thousand. They're at two hundred fifty nine thousand wow. with twenty one days to go. One thousand seven hundred thirty seven backers. What's really mm. neat is it's this little USB thumbstick that's got a Linux on there. Actually, it's got Android on there. Oh, that's I cool. To be clear. Wi-Fi, 802.11n, running ice cream sandwich. That is great. So they've beaten Google to ice cream sandwich <laughs> on the TV, and it's a full-on Android oh, device man. with the Chrome browser, Google Maps, uh, all the apps that you might want to so get on there. I would so use this, yes. Yeah, and what's cool about it is everything stays on there. Everything's persistent, cool. so you can unplug it, Take it to anybody else's TV that has HDMI, plug it in, and you have your entire environment. It could be videos on there, pictures, email, uh, whatever I mean, you want. So, like, if you want to do a slideshow wow. and you want to have it all preset up, you just plug it into their HDMI port. And, and I noticed they were working with some sort of wireless keyboard. I mean, basically, yeah. it's a computer in your pocket. Uh, so, yeah, by default, cool. by default, hmm. you can use apps to manage it. Okay. On your okay. on your smart device, but okay. they have also added support for keyboards that support gyroscopic. Oh, so nice. you can like lean the key, the uh, remote, and it it moves through okay. the menu system. Sure. Uh, and he talks about here in the video about how they they actually intentionally designed it to fit in your pocket, so that way you could just sit down at somebody's computer. Right. They also mention, huh. and I think this is a great observation, is a lot of PC monitors now have HDMI ports. They on do. Them. So you could hook up a USB keyboard because it has a USB port on it. Uh, you could hook up a uh, USB keyboard and mouse to a standard PC screen oh, and man. go into the HDMI port, and you could actually have the entire machine there. You could uh, also hook it straight to a projector and play the oh, video straight to a projector. That is awesome. Yeah. I so a uh, very cool thing. It's called the Pocket TV and mm -hmm. turns any TV into a smart TV. You can get in at 99 bucks, or actually, no, the only one that's still open that's cheap is 110 bucks. That's not bad, though, for what it does. Yeah. For 100 you get to pick black, oh, right. white, or red as the color. Yeah. Um, It'll keep you from losing it. It's bright. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I like it. There's I, the I design one. of it. It looks pretty slick. So you yeah. see it's got a little mini USB here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then it's got HDMI at the back. And I thought, although I don't see another angle of it, I thought it actually has a standard USB on the back of it, too. I thought it did, too, but I'm not seeing it. Yeah. Different uh, different remote remotes, controls yep. you can get for it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it has a 1 gigahertz ARM Cortex-9 in it, 512 megabytes hmm. of RAM, 4 gigabytes of internal storage, hmm. but you can do it. It's got a micro SD slot that goes up to 32 gigs, 802.11n, oh, nice. working on Bluetooth. Uh, HDMI 1.3 is all you need. <laughs> Works for me. I want one. Isn't that a up. neat little toy? That is very cool. And very uh, cool. yeah, you can get it at 110 bucks if you, if you want good, to. Goodbye. All right, Matt. All right. Well, that's all the news for this week. All right, Matt, this week we're talking about something very cool, an open source yeah. piece of software called Airtime. Airtime, you see. And okay. uh, we have to say thank you to System76 for supporting this week's how-to segment. This is a, this one, it's, it's more than just a how-to. It's a how-to software introduction segment. Yep. We'll tell you how-to towards the end of it. But uh, I got to say, so uh, System76. Oh, man. Oh, he's going to pull it out. this bad boy right here. What is this here, Matt? This is the Wild Dog. The Wild Dog, you the say? The Wild Dog. Yeah, the Wild Dog Performance. And uh, this is a great machine that we've been able to use for all kinds of different experiments that it's we're working fantastic. on. So uh, thank you to System76 for sending this Wild Dog. If you're looking for a Linux machine 
that just works out of the box oh, yeah. and is supported by the vendor to run Linux. Oh, yeah, and from release to release. The beautiful thing is, is that uh, even after a new release of Ubuntu comes out, they'll tell you what to expect. What uh, They'll even maybe offer a patch if need be to get things working yeah. for you. And you can go to their own dedicated forum on the Ubuntu forums and get help when needed. Love that. That is awesome. Love that. So, I, yeah. I've used it myself many, many, many times. Of course, System76 has a bunch of great laptops. I'm a oh, desktop yeah. guy, and I like these. I love their laptops, oh, yeah. too. I've, I own I've both. Owned, yep. <laughs> All right, so thank right. you to System76. Go Thanks, check guys. them out if you want to grab yourself a Linux box and you don't ever want to have to worry about the, the hassle that it can be yep. sometimes. Definitely. The way to go. Plus, it's just great to support a company that supports Absolutely. Linux. Exactly. All right, so this week we're talking about Airtime. Airtime. And Airtime is a open source software made from a company called, and it's not at Airtime.com, although Airtime.com looks very cool. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, see, I would have thought it was .com. There okay. you go. It's made by a company mm. called Sound Fabric, and Sound Fabric oh. makes a couple of other projects, but... The one that I want to talk about is Airtime. And okay. Airtime will turn a Linux box into a fully automated radio station. We're talking like DJ in a box, essentially. Oh, DJ style, it's like so man. easy. Oh, so wow. I'll okay. tell you how to get it set up okay. in a minute. But here you go. Here is my Airtime server running in my house right now. Oh, wow. And you can see I have a, uh, I have a playlist here. And what, what Airtime is really cool about, and you could use it, you could use it for podcast creation, which mm -hmm. is cool, automated podcast creation. Oh, we'll talk about yes. that in a minute. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, you could do, if you just want to do a little internet radio stream for a yeah. community or something like that, you could also set it up as a home radio station. And I oh, love wow. this idea, so I'll tell you about that too. Okay. Uh, but, so the airtime approach is it really all starts from their really slick calendar software. It's sort of like, Interesting. It's sort of like Google Calendar for radio streaming. Really? Okay. Yeah, this is So cool. I will log into their, uh, to their, they have a demo site too, because I don't have very much on my calendar, but if you right. take a look at their calendar, they have a click and drag approach to oh, wow. right. two different times. So here yeah. is the Sunday days. So you can see at 1500 hours, here's a block of programming, mm -hmm. and you can okay. go into this block of programming, you can, ent you can, you can edit the content of that programming, oh, wow. and this system will automatically stay on air and just run as long as you have it turned on to do that's so. cool and so if you want to just have music yeah. or podcast or something like that you throw that in there and it'll just automatically play it it connects hmm. to an icecast server and then streams that over icecast and what i have done is i set up a, an, an airtime server in my office okay okay and in my office i i shoot cybite okay. unfilter and coder radio oh, okay and okay. then i stream that audio from my office out into the studio Oh, okay, right. And I, now I'm going to stream. So yeah. what I've done is in airtime, I've set up a calendar appointment. So it says Mondays, 9 a.m. Oh, that's nice. Stream <laughs> Coda Radio. Right. And it just picks up from the line in at 9 a.m. on my sound card. Oh, that's fantastic. That makes out from my board and starts sending it into the studio. That's like hiring a guy to do this for you. I mean, yeah. This is cool. Totally. And then after it. Coda Radio is done, it switches back to music. Yeah. So I have an always going 24-7 radio stream in my house wow so i'm going to start playing with like i'm going to throw in podcasts into right. the playlist and stuff like that and then what i'll do is i'll just tune in on any of my computers mm -hmm. to this always rolling radio station hmm. in my own house and what that's i cool what i that's thought cool. could be Love what it. i thought could be really neat is airtime supports delegation oh, so okay. you could have a community of djs Oh, that's that's helpful. So you have limited privileges you can yeah. assign to them. And oh, you can even yeah, say, yeah, using yeah, yeah. their calendar system, these DJs can't alter the station's programming unless it's during their show window. Oh, that's nice. So if I wanted to say, so like... Uh, that's cool. Like Cheese Bacon, who's in our chat room, and he right. helps out with a lot of our show art. Uh, mm -hmm. He's mentioned to me before, he's like, hey man, you should really do a, an always going 24-7 JB Live radio show. Makes sense. And we have jblive.am, but it's just a 24-7 replay of our reruns. Right. Unless right. we're live, like right now. Of course. Wouldn't it be cool to have a bunch of community members managing the jblive.am stream oh, through something man. like Airtime? They could add their own podcast. That is they could, awesome. They could use software like Mix, that was the app pick at the top yes. of the show, to connect to the Airtime server and broadcast their own podcast. Oh, man. That and it, and cool. it would be just during their window of time, so right. they'd be allowed to do it. And if there wasn't anything scheduled, you can have the server just play a mm -hmm. default playlist. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's still some control, but at the same time, there's community control. That's really yeah. neat. I like that. Okay. You can go in here too, and you can go into uh, yeah. you can go into your streams, and you can say, "All right, well, here's the thing: if I if if you if you detect mm -hmm. a shoutcast stream at this server, right? If you detect that all of a sudden a shoutcast stream goes live, mm -hmm. switch to that, fade from okay. the existing playlist, bring them live, and oh, then when that shoutcast great. stream goes away, 
fade back to the playlist, just oh, like a little fantastic. crossfade. So you could yeah. have, you know, you could have the people out there that are do, say like doing the Linux Mintcast. They could, right. They could connect in while they're doing their show and rebroadcast it on JBLive.am, and they would, they would have all the privileges to do that. And then when they're done, it would automatically just switch right back to the music or the reruns or whatever we have. That going. is really cool. And I mean, just for someone that's like you said, that's actually running their own podcast, being able to bring that into a community effort like that is really powerful. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's really cool. Uh, when uh, when you uh, look oh. at uh, some of their different options here, like. Okay. Uh, check this out. So say you wanted to uh, manage a playlist. They've worked in a lot of really cool um, drag and drop type oh, functionality. Wow, yeah. So here's a here's a list. Hey, say, I, say I know that I'm going to have a, a party at my house and I want right. to have uh, a so Ronald Jenkins uh, playlist, right? All right, sure. I could just go say, oh, let's see, you know what? I, I really like guitar sound. That's the uh, soundtrack mm -hmm. for Unfilter. So you know what? I'll add that again. So you can just drag it over there. Okay. You can also check multiple items. Like say I want Tech Snap and the Faux Show audio to roll during the party because everybody needs to know how great those shows are. Right. You can select multiple items and drag them over here. Oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I love the drag and drop, too. That's so clean. Yeah, so, so then, clean. then when I go back over to my calendar, check mm -hmm. it out. I go down here. Oh, it's already in there. Here's this. I say, well, you know what? Now uh, maybe uh, maybe I want to show the content that I have in there. I can say, oh, yeah, look, it's 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 updated my playlist for the current one. You can mm -hmm. see how far in down the bottom I am to this current set. Cool. It's very that nice. Very cool. Uh, and and it's all it's all um, it's all free. Well, and it's it's all free, and it seems reasonably straightforward. I mean, it, I, obviously, you got to acquaint yourself with the software, but it looks very doable. Very easy, very doable. Yeah, they have. Uh, if you want to just check it out, they have some live demos. You can go over and you can see that oh, they've, nice. they've set up. They're they've got things there. So you can you can create playlists, and you can. Well, I love the fact that you things. can actually play at the demo before you install it, before yeah. you take the time and the time commitment needed to get used to working with it. That's right. really great. Right. So, uh, and of course, you know, like cool. any good radio DJ, every now and then you might want to check in on your radio stream to mm -hmm. make sure it's working. Sure. And they've got that. They've got a little button right here. As you can see, I'm on air. And if, I hit, nice. if I hit listen, it brings up a little pop-up player. And there I can see that, you know, oh, okay, I can tune in and I can right. see what the, what the, what the, what is That's playing cool. on my stream. And yeah, and I can, I can, uh, Oh, this is also really oh, cool. Yeah, no, 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 no. I can also send it to multiple different streaming destinations. <laughs> Out of the box, it does nice. og, it does og vorbis, but you can mm. say, all right, also do an MP3 stream, do an AAC stream. Wow! So you can do you can do multiple format streams from that one. That is machine. so nice. And if you like all of these things, but you don't want right. to set it up on your own box, they also have a whole hosted solution. That's very where you can go cool. and for like okay. fifty bucks a month or right. fifty bucks a year. Or something and as like your as someone's growing, that makes sense. I yeah. think that would be a wise idea. Now, mm. check out Matt how easy it is to get going. You go over to uh, WPAUD has a uh, write-up on it, and okay. uh, it's in if, if you're on Ubuntu, you install one deb, just that, one, and, really? and it okay. loads Icecast, and then just app get install airtime, Whoa, and it, you're done. It sets it up as huh. it runs on your local port 80. So if you have another web server on there, you're gonna you might have issues. Sure, gets everything all set up, automatically sets up the Icecast server for you in the background, sure. configures hmm. this to stream to it. Just nice. automatically, you don't have to do anything. So out of the box, this thing is an ice cast streaming machine, that and you don't awesome. change any of the configuration. Well, don't and I think to. most people would be installing this on a dedicated box anyhow. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So I think that then it just makes it that much more. So simple. I've got it on mm. a VM right now because I was just kind of experimenting yeah, with it. Right. I have a little Atom machine. I'm going to put it on that'll run okay. next to my mixer in my office, mm -hmm. and it will have all of the guts for this airtime server running on this little oh, silent. Man, that's great. Yeah, a little silent so uh, machine. Cool. And that yeah, and it's just right there. It's not taking up any space. That's awesome. Yeah. Airtime cool. uh, airtime at first would seem like something that might not be a good fit for everybody, but I kind of like this concept of having a radio stream in your house all the time. And I want to yeah. put the I want to put the call out there. If there are people in the Linux Action Show community where if I set up a Jupyter Broadcasting Airtime server that was streaming 24/7 to the JB live stream, mm -hmm. If you would like to feature, maybe if you'd like to be a DJ and manage Creative Commons audio on there, or if you have a podcast that you would like to put in there and have stream out, that we could add cool. some community content to the JB Live stream using this. It'd be fully manageable and scalable. And the only caveat would be is we just have to make sure we schedule Windows in there for our actual live content to be yeah. live. But that's just a matter of blocking it out on the calendar. And then the, the airtime software will automatically handle switching between the user-generated playlists and the actual live content from the sound card. What a great way to promote something new. Yeah. You know, so I if, think, yeah. If, if, cool. if you want to promote your podcast on there, yeah. like if you record your podcast and you want to do it live, look at that mix software pick I did. You can you can use that to connect to a, J, a Jupiter Broadcasting mm -hmm. Airtime server. We could do something kind of cool here. Definitely. But I don't want to spend any effort on it if people aren't interested. So I put yeah. a contact us link in the show notes if you'd be interested That'll in That'll allow it. you to weigh it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it might be a neat way to get some new original content on the JB live stream that isn't on the video stream and let people kind of get exposure for their projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I don't know. My phone. I think it's a good plan, and, and I think I think you may have some people bite. Now, uh, mm. I want to say, see if I can find the uh, the nice gentleman in the uh, Linux Action Show subreddit who put the how to on getting their new version. Uh, oh, okay. The Airtime just released 2.1 uh, uh, a few Airtime days ago. Airtime 2.1. Now it includes real time audio editing and things like wow. that. Wow. Okay. Well, that's and, pretty uh, cool. They have a few videos you can check out. They've they've really got a great product here. I'm really surprised it hasn't gotten more attention than it is. You can really turn your Linux box into a radio station fully automated with this, with all kinds of different things. Check yeah, it out. Uh, so I'll cool. have a link in the show notes for the web up 8D or and whatever it's that so is. so easy to install. install. I can't get over it. Yeah, that. look at this. It's, it's just if you're on If you're on a Debian box, it's a two-line install. Yeah. Bam, bam, done. Yeah. You know? So I'll put, I'll put that link in there. They've also got packages for other distros as well. So yeah, Matt. Awesome. You could become a radio it. star. I love it. Maybe we'll have somebody out there in the audience take me up on it. And uh, we would, I think we That'd would need cool. a couple of DJs. We would need some it people would to do music yeah. and some people that want to do podcasts and maybe some people that want to do some live stuff. Exactly. Yeah, if you could get like all three, that would be perfect. It would be even would more be awesome, awesome if somebody awesome. out there has experience with airtime. That would help. Yeah, because I've just started yeah. to, to unwrap it. I had a... Uh, Spend a day with it, maybe. I had a problem I was trying to solve, you know, where I was trying to get the audio out here in a very clean method that didn't require... I was looking at... Um, there's this little dedicated box that runs a very small mm. embedded Linux that you, okay. has an audio in jack and an Ethernet port. Oh, that's and you, nice. And you bring a line out from your mixer and you put it into that, and then the Ethernet plugs into that, and it is a little MP3 streamer box. Oh, no kidding. Just on oh, its own, wow. a little hardware-based okay. one. I thought, boy, that'd be cool, but, you know, it's 200 300 bucks. Yeah, you, yeah there's an investment there, and you... Yeah. Exactly. And it doesn't have... It still doesn't have, like, the community ability. Like, I love the right. idea of... of I, I, I played with... Um, over on jblive.am, mm -hmm. I've been playing with embedding. It's such a pain in the butt, but embedding yeah. an HTML5 shoutcast streaming client. So oh. people just go to jblive.am and there'd be an HTML5 little play button. Right, right. So if, if this takes off, if people wanted to do something like this and we wanted to get some content on the audio stream, uh, I could kind of spruce up that live stream so people just go to the jblive.am page and audio mm -hmm. would be just write one button away and start playing. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. I definitely think you guys should jump on this. This is, sounds really cool. Very cool. So check out Airtime. Yeah. Link in the show notes. And maybe maybe we'll get some great new content on the jblive.am. Yeah. We'll power our very own Jupiter radio station with Airtime. And mad props to the guys over at Sound definitely. Fabric. I'm really impressed with this. Amazing. And yeah. honestly... Uh, you know, why don't I, I should probably I'll look it up while while we're looking at it. Uh, okay, that sounds I, good. I should I should look at their pricing for their pro because well, why not support that, right? I mean, especially if you're going to be doing this for well, and, uh, an shoot, ongoing gig. Right? I mean, if it really took off, I'd be I might be willing yeah. to do their pro route too. Okay, here you go. So maybe let's see That's what the price is. Pretty reasonable. Are. So if you wanted them to host this for thirty bucks a month, you get oh I got to mention this part. Oh you yeah, you get ten yeah. gigs of storage. You good get eh, I'm looking for the users. That would be the thing is how many users do you get. Because that always is where you hit the bottom. Because uh, they have so their prices start at thirty bucks a month and go all the way up to one hundred and fifty bucks a month depending on what you listeners, get. Listeners, blah blah. blah 10. Oh, here you go. Ten users. Yeah. So if you wanted, see, we'd probably need like the five hundred listener package. So we'd be, yeah. we'd be talking one hundred and fifty bucks a month plus another two fifty for the user pack. Or no, I'm sorry, five hundred. That's pretty. That's pretty outside our range. Yeah, it's. Yeah. But uh, so, but you know, we can do it. We can do it. We already have a shoutcaster. We yeah. already have yeah, all. It, we, yeah, you can do it parts. yourself. No, yeah. totally. Uh, the part mm. that I mentioned. Mm. That then I forgot to follow up on because I'm a scatterbrain this morning is <laughs> the automated podcasting part. Mm -hmm. I, I I can't believe I forgot to mention this. So this is how Jupiter Broadcasting could actually become a bit of a platform for podcasters that are starting out. Oh wow, that's gonna be interesting. So you schedule somebody's showtime and airtime yeah. in the calendar in their Google like calendar interface, which is super easy to use. Yeah. Then you say, whenever the stream comes online mm -hmm. and their show schedule starts, mm -hmm. automatically record, and it can record to FLAC or AUG or whatever. Right. When that recording is done, uh -huh. automatically upload it to SoundCloud with uh, all of the metadata attached to it. So, it, so as soon oh, yeah. as you are done recording your podcast, it would just immediately become published oh, and available man. for download and available for listen and available for embed. And SoundCloud has like wow. HTML5 audio embed. So you could, right, like on your blog, right. you could embed the, the player and does inline comments and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. Right. So right. you can... Really extensive. You, can, you yeah. can do like, I mean, with, with the software like Mix, that mm -hmm. was the app pick, mm -hmm. you could connect to an airtime server, you could mix in your own audio bumps using Mix, sure. record it all on the airtime server, and then when you're mm -hmm. done, mm -hmm. have it published. You literally would have a five, ten minute turnaround for podcast production using something like airtime. Oh. If, <laughs> if Jupiter Broadcasting was an audio wow. only network and I was starting today, yeah. I would use airtime oh, yeah. to pipe all of this. Just because you could all, all the show scheduling is right there. You yeah. schedule in one spot and it, you know you can make feeds available for that. 
all of the recordings done in one uh, spot. And I would publish to SoundCloud, and then I would take that and I would make it available in other ways. I, I can, you know, speaking to someone who did early days uh, audio podcasting, you guys have it so easy. <laughs> you have no, I mean, just hosting by itself back in the day was like good luck. Yeah, I know, right? Um, I know. Man. I mean, you, oh, all you need oh, now is an airtime server and a SoundCloud yeah. account. Yeah. Where was this like just a few years ago? I mean, yeah. oh my god. This is really cool stuff. Amazing. Uh, and and uh, Airtime handles all of the back end plumbing for you. So check yeah. it out. I like it. I wanna, awesome. And if you guys have any Airtime installations out there already, let yeah. me see what you've done. Definitely. I'd like to get some ideas. So uh, send those in as well. All right, Matt. All right. Well, that's the Linux Action Show's look at Airtime. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Now, I got a couple things I want to plug, and then like I promised last week, we're going to get to some viewer email. Ooh. Yeah. All right. Cool. First up, uh, everybody has is, is been extremely, extremely, uh, this appears to, I, I, I'm happy, I'm happy. People love Coder Radio. Should be. Coder Radio has been a big hit, and episode one came out last week. We'll be recording episode two tomorrow, Monday, at 9 a.m. Pacific over jblive.tv. Mm-hmm. And uh, just a warning. Okay. We will be covering the fallout of the Worldwide Developers Conference at Apple. Because this is Ooh. a developer show. Well, that's true. That's true. That, that's fair. Uh, now, okay. uh, both both uh, Michael and myself are obviously extensive open source backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. And that's our leaning. Uh, but we're going to kind of take a crack at covering some of the uh, Apple Worldwide Developer Conference stuff. Just to sure. get that out of the way. Because, you know, it's developer-related yeah. stuff. Um, after that, he's got uh, some amazing episodes lined up, including... Two episodes to cover Google I.O. in a couple of weeks. Oh. Google I.O. is going to be huge for the show. And yeah. we've also got some great episodes kind of in between there to uh, sort of help some of the newbies out there. Some of the first That's episodes, really like our, good. our first episode mm-hmm. was Gateways to Programming. Yes. We're also going to cover topics like really the you know the difference between scripting and developing and well, things exactly. like that. Because yeah. I know that there's some audiences that are going to be making the transition. This is, this is going to be a show that is really focused at the art mm-hmm. and business of software development. And we figure for the first few episodes, we'll cover some beginner basics, and then oh, we'll yeah. kind of move on from there. So they always have these fundamentals people can refer back to. People have loved Quarter Radio Episode 1. Oh, it was Check awesome. it out if you haven't seen it yet. And oh. Episode 2 will be out next week. And five fantastic episodes in a row. I'm on a streak, people. Episode nice. 5 of Unfilter Made in America is out. Nice, and uh, nice. this episode, we look at prison labor, the kind of money that prisoners mm-hmm. make in prison labor, the kind of things that are made, the economics and the realities of it. Plus, mm-hmm. we also take a quick look at the situation in Europe. Oh, Spain's okay. recent bailout. Oh, and yeah. did you know, Matt, mm. there are 64 drone bases operational in the United States? That scares the living pejeebus out of me. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm going to be driving home white knuckled all the way. You know what? It, they all wow. sound like very heavy topics that you don't wouldn't really you know yeah. think they would all go together. Well, but I think I think if you got yeah, you kind of want to know. We've got I, a you know, got I a, would. you know we've got a great formula for the show. We've got a solid cast of yeah. four members that really we have a, we have. Sure. It's funny. It's it's heavy stuff we cover, but I right. think at the end you always wrap up the episode and you feel kind of good. You wrap you end in a good yeah. mood. So it's I'm, I'm pretty proud of the way that's turned out. So go check those out. And also Matt. I want to give you a plug for your Twitter account. If people okay. want to follow you during the week, they can go over to twitter.com slash Matt Hartley. And also check me out on Google+. Plus. Uh, probably the easiest way to do that is I will tweet my Google+. Plus account. You just do it that we way. have a link to your Google+. Plus account. Oh, well, then the we're good too. to go. Yeah, just follow me there. I'm yeah. more active on Google+, Plus, but yeah. I'm on Twitter. I'll answer questions there. I rotate. See, next week I'll oh, plug your Yeah, hand. see, for me, it's like, eh. You know. Well, no, I just rotate the plugs. That way they don't wear out. So I'm all about wanna... the shiny object. So next thing. week will be Google+, Plus, but I don't want to step <laughs> on Google+, Plus too often. Right, 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 right. Totally works, though. All right, cool. why, don't we, uh, why don't we get to some email? The first email yep. comes from Graham, and he says, Hi, guys, I really enjoy last and wondered if you knew about Solus OS. Hmm. The project seems to be interesting to me as I think Linux it's what Linux Mint should be doing. They okay. don't use Cinnamon but use GNOME 3 technologies to make a usable and nice looking desktop. I'd be interested to know your opinion of it and have a great weekend. So this really echoes a lot of what came out of our Cinnamon review is why is Cinnamon doing its own thing when it's really right. just GNOME 3? Right, right. I haven't checked it out. So Solus OS is a modern Linux desktop operating system based on the hugely popular Debian Linux distribution. It works out of the box with great support for all your modern day computing needs. Feels very uh, yeah. I, I like the landing page. I mean, it's definitely <laughs> it's a attra- it's attractive. And I'm sorry, I used the term landing page, but that's what it is. No, I wasn't laughing at that. Yeah, you know, it's just that is a first impression. Isn't yeah, it? I mean, that's literally yeah, exactly as, as he said. It's just for me, it just it feels like a landing page, and that's okay. It, it looks nice, but it looks kind of commercial. Uh-huh. I kind of want to give it a shot, though. Well, it looks good. Uh, it, you know, it, it, I, I'm, I'm still waiting for the part where something's like 
drastically unique about it, but it well, it's looks gnome cool. two, I believe. Okay. I could be wrong on that. Uh, well, that's and, kind of uh, mm. or no, I guess it's gnome three, but it looks like gnome two. That's what it is. Huh. It's kind of like so a is it like a, approach. a mate kind of thing, or yeah, exactly. Only yeah, actually okay. using <laughs> it's actually using okay. actually using gnome three as the back wow. end, which is I think which I think is very interesting. It's that's, sort of what that's, cinnamon okay. Might that's different. I'll give you that. Uh, I like that. I also like the fact yeah. that it's based on Debian, but they backport some of the big things. So you know, really? you've got like you've got LibreOffice three five in here, which so is no, that's a different. Which is not so it's Debian not stable. it is not based on Ubuntu. It is based on Debian. That's what yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's kind of a simply Memphis kind of approach. Okay. Uh, uh, well, with that minus the KDE, it, they've got you know. I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could load any desktop you wanted. That's really, cool. Well, that's cool Debian, though. But. I mean, it's like it's it's obviously very very different. Okay. Kind of kind of piques my interest a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I mean, from the desktop perspective, it'd be interesting to see how uh, you know if they tweak the kernel at all or how yeah. that worked out. But. But uh, anyway, cool. thanks to Graham for passing yeah. along. We'll, I'm to, I'll check that out. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, now, also, uh, this is another kind of cinnamon Debian-related one. This one came in from uh, the guy's name. His nickname is C. Debian. And he okay. pointed us to a, a pretty lengthy blog post that talks about how out of touch GNOME is with its users. Hmm. And hmm. Uh, he goes on to, to, to kind of, you know what it is? In a lot of ways, is what, what Linus touched on in some ways, how right. they sort of, they, they, they're dumbing it down too much. and Well... This, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if I necessarily <laughs> agree with it, but I want to put the link in the show notes because I want to get people talking about this particular topic because I think we are definitely noticing. I'll put it in the Chris's stash section of the show notes. Okay, a link to this blog post. Uh, I think what we're noticing is the users, the longtime Linux users with GNOME three, are feeling lost. That's fair. That's fair. And but, there is sort of like this: where do I go now? I mean, isn't that what well, isn't that what Solo S is y- is right? I mean, it is, but at the same time. Gnome three is being forked six ways from Sunday. It, there, there's continuous forks coming about. About you know, no one's locking you into anything. I mean, I get oh, it. Yeah. I mean, you, you want to go back to that, you know, to the Gnome two experience. Well, there well, there's an option. For why that. do things like Cinnamon and Solo S exist if it's not for that? Well, Cinnamon's only real claim to fame that I found anything even remotely compelling about it is the audio management is frankly less clicks than it is on Gnome three. Or I mean, that's literally the only thing I found other than the fact that it's slower. But um, you know, I mean, that I would love to see integrated into yeah. a regular Gnome desktop. But other than that, eh, you know. I think I think cares. though I think things like Cinnamon and Solo S and yeah. and what uh, what C Debian sent along in this email about mm-hmm. this blog post. This is right. why I want to talk about it. Yeah, is no. I think they're all trying to solve a problem that in one or two more releases of XFCE are not going to matter. That's true. XFCE that's true. is the GNOME two replacement. Right. You know, I think that's really the future of people be. who don't want to use GNOME three but still want to yeah. use a GTK based desktop. I would I would agree with that. And, but I also think going back to what Linus said, he that you know, the people who are doing this stuff, they're doing it for themselves. You know, really. I mean they're they're kinda of taking their own approach to it. I mean, yeah, they're putting it out there for folks, but this is something they obviously feel strong about. They don't want to wait. Uh, they want it now. You know, uh, maybe it's duplication. But Good point. They want it now. Yeah. The XFC isn't quite there for everybody yet. No, it's yeah. really not. I mean I, I like it, I play with it, it's fine, but it's you know, I use it on some older PCs, but it's not really something I get too excited about. Right. You know. Right. Hmm. As far as dumbing it down, I remember a time when they said that about package managers. You know, just saying. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, so everything yeah. uh, kind of comes full yeah. circle. Uh, anyways, thanks to Graham yeah. and C. Debian for sending in their emails, and uh, I'm going to try to read a couple every show. So send yours in. You can use the contact us yeah. form over the top at jupiterbroadcasting.com, or you can email linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Also... You can submit it to link. Oh no, that's the TechSnap one. You can nope. submit it to linuxactionshow.reddit.com. The Linux Action Show subreddit is a great place to mm-hmm. submit stuff like it that is. because we won't necessarily get to everyone on the show. Right. But you generally almost always get a response on the Linux Action oh, Show yeah. subreddit, which is an I'm awesome subreddit. It. That'll be the last thing I mentioned for the show before we wrap up. Go over there, and go, I'm pretty active there. So you go know. to Linux Action. So I'm 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 there yeah. several times a day as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, go over there and 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 join this Linux Action Show subreddit. You can help fuel the Linux news. For a lot of places. There's a lot of blogs and yeah. other podcasters that are now using this as their source for news because oh, this yeah. is, I swear to God, one of the best Linux news subreddits. Oh, it is. Absolutely. It's better than the standard r slash Linux because oh, it's too yeah. unfocused. Yeah. Uh, no, that's all over the map. So this is much, much more. Clear. I mean, I, I know yeah. I might be a little biased. Yeah. I might no, it, it really is. I mean, I because I, I participate in both and I would definitely say this oh, is yeah. much, much more yeah. news focused. So thank you to everyone yeah. who does that. Thank you everyone who submits links and votes yeah. and comments. You guys are awesome. Appreciate Go it. Check that out. All right, Matt. Well, I think that just about wraps up this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. All right. I'll see you right back here next Sunday. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs>
Okay. All right. Man. All right. <laughs> All right, here we go. Right. Had some caffeine. <laughs> that always helps, right? Yeah. And by caffeine, I mean Coke. No, I'm <laughs>